Oxygen, the most common element in our world, can be isolated in a number of ways that tell us something about its properties and also about physical and chemical changes in general. The following seven demonstrations will show you some of the methods of preparing oxygen. When water and sodium peroxide are mixed, they produce hydrogen peroxide initially. However, the reaction also produces a lot of heat, which decomposes the peroxide as fast as it is formed, releasing oxygen. The preparation of stable but energy-rich compounds, like sodium peroxide, is one of the general ways of capturing oxygen for later use. A number of these are convenient sources of oxygen in the laboratory. When water is added, the reaction starts immediately. The clear greenish material at the bottom is sodium peroxide the water hasn't reached. Above it is sodium hydroxide solution mixed with bubbles of oxygen gas, and above that should be nearly pure oxygen. We'll test for it by the traditional method, combustion, which itself is one of the most useful chemical reactions. The oxygen ignites the ember that air will not. The successful repetition of the test shows that there is more oxygen in the test tube and we can infer that the reaction is still taking place. This time we'll collect oxygen from a stable liquid using a catalyst. Although there are still unknowns in the catalytic process, it is thought that the catalyst provides handholds for the reactants to grab onto. We're using hydrogen peroxide for the liquid and manganese dioxide as the catalyst. Hydrogen peroxide will oxidize materials directly at high concentration and is used as an oxidant in liquid-fueled rockets without the intervention of a catalyst to produce the oxygen first. Concentrated hydrogen peroxide is stable if the solution doesn't contain certain transition elements such as iron or manganese. The solid manganese dioxide is of course a rich source of this effective transition element and a potent catalyst for decomposing the hydrogen peroxide as the immediate reaction shows. We'll use the same combustion test, although you must realize it's not a specific test. You can't play Diogenes looking for some honest oxygen with a glowing splint because you'd get the same results with fluorine, chlorine, or some of the nitrogen oxides. So this test is useful only when you know what you have and what it's possible to get. The bubbling action, as well as the fact that the splint continued to light, show that oxygen is still being produced. In this demonstration, we'll collect the oxygen by driving it into a test tube, which will be filled with water and set in this beaker. The compound containing oxygen is potassium chlorate, and the catalyst is again manganese dioxide. This is the most common and convenient way of preparing oxygen in a laboratory. First, the catalyst is put into this bulb so that it can be added later. Then the potassium chlorate is put in a test tube for heating. Finally, the second tube for the oxygen is prepared. By having a tube filled with water for collecting, we avoid mixing the oxygen with other gases in the air that have similar densities. Using the cork is a good method for keeping liquid in the inverted tube. Now the potassium chlorate is heated gently to get the air out of the delivery tube and to show that you won't get much reaction before adding the catalyst. Of course, if you heated the potassium chlorate well above its melting point, it would break down into the products potassium chloride, and oxygen. But the catalyst saves both time and trouble. So now we'll add the manganese dioxide from the delayed filler bulb 
and you'll see an immediate reaction. The reaction takes place at a much lower temperature than without the catalyst, so that less heating is required. Other materials than manganese dioxide are also effective, like iron oxide or vanadium pentoxide. You can see the gas bubbles forcing their way into the tube. In just a little time, the water has been displaced by the gas. The density of air is not much different from oxygen's, so no particular care has been taken to keep the oxygen in the tube during the combustion test. We're using the same test in all of these experiments for consistency and because it's adequate for these controlled conditions. But an exclusive and significant proof would require a series of tests based on a more detailed knowledge of oxygen's properties. Pure oxygen can also be obtained by heating mercuric oxide. Through this experiment, oxygen was first discovered by Joseph Priestley in 1774. It's also of interest as an example of a reversible reaction. The mercury and oxygen produced can recombine to form mercuric oxide again. Priestley used both reactions in his studies. Here we'll do only the preparation of oxygen. The test tube is corked before heating to prevent the poisonous mercury vapor from escaping and also to help retain the relatively small amounts of pure oxygen produced. After heating for a few minutes, there is a visible change in the color of the mercuric oxide. This is probably due to the rearrangement of molecules or to a change in the crystalline form of the solid. Now you can see the mercury vapor forming as droplets on the side of the test tube and on the top. We'll stop heating and allow the test tube to cool. The original darkening ascribed to change in crystal structure is reversible. You'll note that the mercuric oxide reverts to its original bright orange color as it cools. You've seen the mercury droplets form. Now we'll test for the oxygen. Of course, the combustion test converts the oxygen into water and carbon dioxide. If, instead of using up the oxygen by testing, we had heated the tube again at a lower temperature over a period of time, we could get the mercury and oxygen to recombine. The fractional distillation of liquid air method to produce oxygen depends on the different boiling points of nitrogen and oxygen. Therefore, it's also an example of physical, not chemical, change. The liquid air floats on the water and evaporates. Nitrogen boils off before the oxygen because it has the lower boiling point. The combustion test this time shows that little oxygen is present in this vapor. But when we try it again, we see that we're now getting oxygen gas. This is the chief industrial method because it uses the least energy and the cheapest material, namely air. Oxygen is usually made on the spot because storing it's a problem, although it does come in gas tanks for labs and is shipped at low temperature in liquid form called LOX for industry. We're blowing the vapor out so you can see the remaining globules of liquid oxygen skittering around on the surface of the water. This time we're using liquid nitrogen as a refrigerant for this hollow copper tube which we'll fill to bring its temperature below the boiling point of oxygen. 
The nitrogen is spitting and boiling over as we cool the copper tube down to the temperature of the very cold liquid nitrogen. When the copper tube is hung in the air, its low temperature makes the oxygen condense out of the air on its sides and run down in liquid form. We'll test at the base where the liquid has collected. You can see the inside level of the liquid nitrogen dropping because water is condensing on the outside as a white frost above the nitrogen. The separation of oxygen through electrolysis of water is also a common industrial method. Two electrodes are used to pass an electric current as shown by the light. However, distilled water does not pass a current, so we have to add an electrolyte, sulfuric acid in this case. The electrolyte provides ions which can move and allow the current to flow. The light goes back on, showing that the ions are now being drawn to the poles. So now we'll place the electrodes in this Hoffman tube, an apparatus which makes it easy to separate and collect the gases. Then we add the solution we just tested. As before, a gas is starting to be evolved at each of the poles. The stopcocks are closed to keep the gas from escaping and we have only to wait until enough collects for testing. Electrolysis of water is a common industrial method where power is available at little cost and other materials can also be sold. For example, electrolysis of salt brine can yield oxygen, hydrogen, chlorine, and sodium hydroxide all at once. You'll note that about twice as much gas formed on the right side from the negative pole as on the positive. We have enough gas, so we'll test its identity. First, from the positive pole. It fulfills the old-fashioned criterion of oxygen. Next, the gas from the negative pole, which acts like and is hydrogen. So in these seven experiments, you have seen the ubiquitous oxygen produced and some of its properties demonstrated.